Well, as we record this episode, it is just before Christmas. So as you listen to this, it's just after Christmas. So I hope everybody had a had a good holiday and enjoyable Christmas time. In Australia, evidently, they don't have snow. So it's, And Joel is in some place where they don't have snow either, but they're trying to have snow. We it's 22 here, degrees. <laughs> there, That's what they're saying. We up here in the in the hardy northeast will have plenty of snow, it looks like, for Christmas. So we'll have a white Christmas. That'll be very enjoyable. And this week we're talking about a number of subjects. And the, the top one is uh, Phil Totaro comes back on, and Phil's from Interstore, of course. And he had an interesting uh, discussion about wind turbine leasing. Does it make sense for OEMs to lease their wind turbines instead of selling them to make the economics work better for the operators? And we'll talk about Wind Spider, which is a climbing crane or climbing-ish crane uh, that RWE is investing in uh, to help some of their offshore operations. And we'll see, is it going to be better for offshore construction? Can it help some onshore construction? We'll see what happens there. Uh, and then as well, jumping over to the U.S., uh, NREL and uh, taking some federal funds and investing into some of these small to medium-sized wind turbine companies. So uh, Rosemary gives us some tips on where they're, where these small wind turbines are useful and where they absolutely are not. And then we move on to repowering in Europe. They uh, have a lot of wind turbines that are 15 or even 20 years old. So repowering is going to be a big thing in the next few years. And finally, we talk about wind turbines on Mars and uh, yeah, what design changes they would need to make to get them working there and whether that's going to help us here on Earth. <laughs> I'm Alan Hall, president of WeatherGuard Lightning Tech, and I'm here with Australian renewables guru, Rosemary Barnes, and my good friend from Wind Power Lab, Joel Saxon. And this is the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. Well, we have Phil Totaro back from Intel Store and check out his LinkedIn page and his website. You can find him at intelstore.com. Phil has done some research on what it costs to operate and maintain wind turbines in the United States and has also kind of cross-linked that with PPA prices. And Phil, would you describe the, the problem that you see coming up in terms of how to operate a wind turbine farm efficiently? Thanks, Alan. Thanks for having me. Um, so... After several months of doing a, a lot of research on uh, kind of the uh, average production that we're seeing in the United States market, um, and thanks to the, the Energy Information Administration for making that data public, um, we've also coupled that information with some FERC published uh, power purchase data, uh, power purchase contract data. and. Um, We've also been able to, using our you know financial modeling and some actual um, O and M contract data that we have, uh, we've been able to build some basically project pro forma models for almost all the the operational assets in the U.S. Um, and what we're noticing is that the projects that have been built since um, about 2015 are now at at least 10 years or longer to see a full net positive return on capital. Um, projects that were built prior to 2015, you know, because of a much higher PPA price, um, they're probably, you know, somewhere between, you know, seven years and 10 years, maybe 12, um, to see a, a full net positive return on uh, the, the upfront CapEx. So because the PPA prices have been getting lower and lower and lower, um, and we've bounced off the bottom, thankfully, which we saw back in about 2018-19, where you know there were some PPAs out there from some of the Midwestern um, co-ops um, as well as uh, power marketing companies um, that were being signed for you know between like nine dollars and let's say eleven, twelve, thirteen dollars per megawatt hour. Wow. So the the production tax credit in the United States has been very helpful for the independent power producers to maintain profitability. Without it, they would have a completely upside down project for 50 years, um, you know, before they'd see a, a net positive return. And what's happening is there's there's this very interesting conundrum of, you know, when when a project developer is buying wind turbines, 
they're doing it with the premise that they're going to operate this asset for at least 20, uh, maybe 25, 30 years. Sure. They're buying yeah. turbines that have a design life of 20, 30, and maybe even 40 years now, according to you know some certification with DNV or, or somebody else. And the question is that because the wind turbines, you know, based on some of the previous research we, we've talked about, um, wind turbines really only have like a, a useful life before you start seeing a performance drop off of like 10 years. Right. So the question is, knowing that you're going to have to repower for both p operational reasons, um, the, the turbine performance drops, and because you want to be able to requalify for the production tax credit, why are we doing, um, you know, A, why are we doing turbines that have a design life of, of 20 years in the first place, or 30 years mm -hmm. or 40 years, um, number one, and number two, why are we not just leasing the equipment knowing that you know instead of signing a, a an equipment purchase contract that is supposed to be for the duration of the project you know you're going to repower uh anyway so why not lease the equipment and then allow the oem to refurbish it with whatever equipment they want to deliver that's going to be the best performing equipment after whatever the time frame is you know 10 years etc if you want to be able to requalify for the ptc so it's not like equipment leasing isn't new, you know, mm -hmm. especially in industrial equipment. But mm. the reason that we're not using it already in wind energy is is a bit confounding, especially given some of these other commercial factors that we're seeing. Have you heard of an OEM offering that option to anybody? Not yet. Okay. And Joel, that's a great question, because what I think is likely to happen is like, let's say a company like Nordex would try to do mm -hmm. it. Um, I don't think everyone else is necessarily going to follow suit. Right. I think if you want to have somebody do it, you're going to have to have demand from you know the next eras mm -hmm. and Berkshire Hathaways of the world to encourage companies like GE Investus to do it. And once one of the majors in the U.S. does it, you'll get everyone yeah, else to, to start falling suit. in line. Yeah. Don't you have to be your own bank to do that? In a sense that you're that capex and from the operator side, which would be deposited into a, a GE's bank account. Now GE's on the hook for that asset. So they have to be able to have enough bankroll to, to go off and do that. Do the OEMs have enough money stashed away to, to do those kind of lease agreements? That's a good question. Um, the short answer is yes and no. Um, <laughs> they certainly have uh enough capital if they wanted to reallocate from other areas of their business mm -hmm. you know sure. obviously as we know that some of the, the some of the wind divisions at a, a company like ge siemens etc they've been suffering um but they do have the capital necessary to be able to do that if they wanted to the more operative issue with doing a leasing program is are you really selling somebody equipment or are you leasing them the ability to produce kilowatt hours um and that's i think you know this is kind of getting a little bit off topic but you know it's the same thing with maintenance like maintenance contracts today are also done on like a per turbine per year basis it you know there's availability guarantees etc but it's not done on like you know we're going to guarantee that you're going to be able to produce a um, kilowatt hour or a megawatt hour at you know a certain price tag and so for equipment leasing that seems to me to be the more operative thing is is isn't that regardless of the equipment that is being delivered you know to be able to produce these these kilowatt hours that should be what you're guaranteeing in addition to if not irrespective of the the machine availability that we're all used to yeah yeah it's different like the challenge i guess the ch uh, well the challenge with it is is obvious that it's a it's a fundamentally different way of doing business than what everybody's used yeah. to today and again it's yeah. it's something that we're the problem is that there's not demand for it specifically but there's going to be because the, again with ppas coming down and things getting more expensive to maintain how is the independent power producer not going to be in the same boat of thin margins just like the oems are today yeah you know, prices can't keep coming down and you don't reduce costs correspondingly. This is one way that you can reduce costs, but it's a sea change in the way you do business. Well, the thought is, is like a, a friend of mine uh, runs a, a, a mining company here in Texas. And when they ramp up and ramp down, instead of always buying their big pieces of iron, you know, their big Caterpillar D10s or whatever, 
they they lease them mm -hmm. but now it's on an availability model so they need to be moving material in that pit but if their d10 goes down and it's down for more than 24 hours well xyz caterpillar has to show up with a low boy and another d10 for them to use while they're fixing that mm -hmm. one you can't do that with a wind turbine right so that kind of complicates yeah. the 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 business model there as well yeah and it's, it's a great point too because you're you're in a position where you're not only going to have to still potentially maintain an availability guarantee on on mm -hmm. the individual turbines in a wind park um, but the entire park still has to meet a certain level of production in order to avoid mm -hmm. liquidated damages or um, right. you know like substituted power buying to make up for any production losses that you are necessarily yeah. going to incur. I think that's part of almost every single power right. purchase contract these days. So. so so here's a here's another question for you, Phil, about this. Now we're talking PTC, PTC, PTC. Now, if you go to a leasing model, by the word of the law of the IRA bill, you lose the ITC, correct? Technically, yes, or, because or the you OEM have to get spend... It. Well, right. yeah, that's a great question because the 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 operative thing is that if you're it's it's predicated on like a sales transaction, mm -hmm. you know, whether you're safe harboring or, or otherwise, it, the ITC is predicated on like a sales transaction mm -hmm. uh, taking place between an equipment vendor and a power producer. So they could tweak that language to say that the ITC goes to the OEM. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking again, it would be. Because otherwise it would be like a change right. of ownership yeah. or something, right? Yeah, because again, that's that's one of these things like I was mentioning before. Like right now, everybody's happy with the fact that there's certainty with the PTC rules out to 2033, at least at this point. The complication is if PPAs are going to stay at below $20 a megawatt hour and your average, you know, maintenance cost per turbine per year is going to be like between 45,000 to 50,000 regardless of the size of the turbine um which is where the market's at at the moment that's creating an unsustainable i mean even if you have like a 45 to 50 you know percent net capacity factor uh, on your asset you're still not making enough money mm -hmm. you know if the ptc goes away after 10 years and you don't renew it by repowering or refurbishing you know your your asset you're it's going to take you like 40 years or plus uh mm -hmm. you know even longer to to um you know, to see a net positive return on capital on your assets. So this is the, you know, the fact that the PPAs are coming down so much is what's kind of creating this whole situation. But the PPAs keep coming down because we're still trying to, you know, demonstrate how much more cost competitive we are against fossil fuels, um, et cetera. Only if you've got a high price of fossil fuel and a low, you know, per cost of wind, you would think, oh, well, people would be demanding wind you know and solar more more readily but that's not necessarily the case you know if, if you've got a high price of natural gas and oil the companies who invest in natural gas and oil are making money so they're going to keep investing right. over there right. instead of here right. so, so it's that, it's a that, challenge but, but that works in a very unique way for the oems right they know based on the production tax credit that it's a 10-year cycle mm -hmm. they'll say that the wind turbines will last 20 years but the data indicates they're lasting roughly 10, you know that they're going to be back again looking to buy an upgraded turbine or upgraded blades, something at year 10. As an OEM, you don't want that to go away. You don't want to turn that 10-year cycle into well, a 20-year cycle. And and the thing is, there have been instances where you know one OEM sold their turbines to a project and then the project was repowered after 10 years with a different OEM's mm -hmm, equipment. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, yeah, a lot that. of that yep. had to do with, you know, the fact that like some companies aren't still operating or they don't have a turbine that fits the tower because they don't want to, you know, if they can avoid it, they don't want to, you know, take yeah. down the tower and they want to be able right. to reuse the foundation, etc. All the electrical interconnection, you know, it saves yeah. some cost. So basically yeah. you're reselling and reblading the turbine. Um, but there is is also the challenge of, you know, if you've got a, um, e, you know, a turbine that's designed for 20 years, it's being run harder than it should be. You know, it's I mean, to be clear about you know sure. this this concept, like the turbine would theoretically last for 20 years 
if it was right. being run consistently inside the manufacturer's specified mm-hmm. warranty, mm-hmm. you know, sure. design envelope. Sure. Uh, the problem, obviously, is that some companies want to get maximum PTC value during the first 10 years of their project. Yeah. So they're running Run the wheels off of that it. turbine into the to. ground and they making as much money as they can. Sure. so that they can at least hope to turn a profit. Yeah. I mean, there's other there's other situations, too, with the repowering where, uh, I mean, we hear it all the time, but OEMs just don't want to play ball sometimes. There's people I know, I've spoken to personally that say, sure. hey, we talked with X OEM that used to own our, tur- or that is our turbines, and they told us, here's what the price is going to be to repower it. We're going to handle everything. And they said, well, we'd like to do this and this. And they said, you don't get the option of that. This is how your repower is going to go. And, and, the, and the asset owner's like, man, well, we, okay, then no, we're going to do it ourselves. We're going to get stuff from over here. And they end up saving 25% of the cost and whatnot and kind of having a customized Mm -hmm. little project for themselves. And that happens quite readily too. So my thought is, is as an OEM, now Alan, back to your point of, you get that you get that cash influx of capital when you originally sell the towers, and then you may get another cash influx on year ten. If you could take those two values, even them out in lease payments over that ten years, it might be better for your business model. Could be, mm-hmm. sure, sure. There's too many there's too many moving variables at the moment, yeah. right? We we like to have one or two variables in play. It seems like we have ten. <laughs> I always look to uh, American Clean Power and wonder. I know they had a change in leadership. I don't know if anybody else noticed that, but American Clean Power had a change in leadership recently, and I kind of wonder if that's a result of sort of the the market situation that we're in. There's just too many variables, and everybody's trying to figure out how they're going to make money in this marketplace. And as uh, the membership of the ACP uh, fluctuates a little bit, they're getting demand from their members to say, hey, let's stabilize this thing. And right yeah. now, Phil, am I, am I wrong? I mean, it just seems like it's probably the most unstable I've seen it in the last 10 years. Uh, agreed. And the the operative thing here is, you know, this, this public acknowledgement by the OEMs that they're struggling financially with low margins mm-hmm. and, and yep. you know, pricing pressure. This is yep. all ba- based upon uh, uh, is the net or is the net effect of what they've been feeling yeah. for three to five years. Yes. Well, you haven't even seen the IPPs publicly acknowledge yet that they're in financial distress because of these lower yeah. PPA prices and, and right. how tight things are. So, you know, hopefully what we've done is, uh, shine, you know, to shine a spotlight on, um, you know, what's the, the, the coming storm, if you will. Um, yeah. But you're going to start hearing more about this soon. And, you know, it's it's it, it just it's it's as tight as it's been in as far as long as I can remember. I mean, years yeah. gone by. You know, we had like the PTC go away and then come back, but that was when PPAs were maybe, you know, 50, 60, 70 dollars. Right. Um, with PPAs averaging in the past two years around $25, according to FERC data, yeah. the, the, you That's can't screw around. You know, you, you've nope. got to you've got to operate as efficiently as you possibly can mm-hmm. right now. So one one last question for you, Phil, from my side here now. A player that may be poised to take something like this on. Uh, of course, we've, we're always following the news of what's happening in the marketplace, but it looks like Siemens is about to be taken over by parent company, right? And they're making a move to possibly delist them. Delisting Siemens, does that give them the flexibility to start maybe playing with some leasing models or playing with some other kind of uh, economic models that for a publicly traded company might be a little bit harder? Yes, and to be clear, they're delisting the Siemens Gamesa division, right. but it's still going to become part of public Siemens Energy anyway. Right, so, right, right. yes, but I, you know, the the question is, like we talked about before, you know, equipment leasing is not necessarily new, mm-hmm. but it's new for wind. Right. And like you mentioned, you know, the fact that you're still going to have to maintain a certain level of availability, that there, the fact that, you know, nobody's really used to this type of business model in this industry yet. Um, and this is going to take a while to implement, but it's one way, you know, according to the calculations we've done, it's one way that you could indeed smooth out the first, you know, 10, 15, 20 years of, of uh, payments. Um, 
you know, and ensure a certain amount of cash flow for everybody, the IPP, the the wind turbine OEM, um, and the, the, you know, whether it's a utility or, or a corporate power off taker, you know, they have a certain expectation of, you know, the amount of, of energy they're going to receive, so, or electricity they're going to receive. So, you know, that's, that's what this does, is it's one way of solving a commercial conundrum that we now face. It's maybe not the only way, but it's probably going to be the way that I see the market evolving, um, specifically because it's it's the easiest way to go from just you know huge upfront cost and you know huge amortized cost in terms of long term maintenance contract uh, to something that could potentially. Um, you know, get a, a contract that could end up getting truncated if they end up repowering, especially if, like you mentioned, the the um, asset owner wants to repower with a different set of equipment. Right. Then, you right. know, what happens to the long term service contract if they switch OEMs? Um, yes. You know, there's there's question. all kinds of commercial considerations. <laughs> it sounds like it sounds like if it goes this way, a lot of ISPs may be purchased by OEM service departments because they're going to need them. Yes, and it also probably means that if you're self-performing, you're going to have to get up to speed on equipment makes and models that you may not necessarily be as familiar with. So the question then goes back to something we talked about a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. which was, are the insurance companies that sometimes have to backstop some of these uh, some of these companies if they don't balance sheet underwrite themselves? Mm -hmm. um, you know, are the insurance companies going to get on board with this whole thing? Um, because that's the other that's the other key to this is the the insurance carriers have to sign off on yeah. whatever this is in order for the financiers to sign off on it, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole, you know, <laughs> great big value chain here that has to be mm -hmm. happy with uh, with any kind of sea change in the way business is done. So Phil for the head of the DOE in 2024. Is that what we're saying? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I appreciate the sentiment, but you know what 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 I'll say about it, Joel, is that the you know if people have been following what you know Intel Store has been doing for the last you know thirteen years, you'll know that we're kind of on the bleeding edge and sometimes a little bit ahead of the curve with a lot of these things. I guarantee that in twenty twenty three. This is my my 2023 prediction, everybody, <laughs> for the new year. I guarantee you are going to be hearing more about IPP profitability challenges in 2023 and beyond. Oh, I like it. Well, because of everything we've just talked yeah. about. That's, so That's a pretty good <laughs> prediction, Phil. We're, we're going to hold you to that, yeah. and, and we're going to have you back, obviously. So everybody, check out Intelstore, Intelstore.com, I-N-T-S, sorry, I-N-T-E-L-S-T-O-R. Dot com or just looked on LinkedIn. Just go to Intel Store on LinkedIn where you can find Phil's posts about all the things happening in renewable energy. Phil, thanks for joining the program again. We'll have you back soon. Thanks, everybody. Lightning is an act of God, but lightning damage is not. Actually, it's very predictable and very preventable. Strike Tape is a lightning protection system upgrade for wind turbines made by WeatherGuard. It dramatically improves the effectiveness of the factory LPS so you can stop worrying about lightning damage. Visit weatherguardwind.com to learn more, read a case study, and schedule a call today. Well, if you've been watching the news lately, you've seen some cranes tip over, uh, both onshore and <laughs> ship-based cranes on some offshore projects. So. Crane safety is becoming more and more of an issue as Roseberry keeps building bigger and bigger wind turbines. We got to get and create bigger and bigger cranes, and then stability becomes an issue. And every once in a while, they tip over. There's a the really serious one that happened over in Belgium a couple of weeks ago. Our yeah. my friend Kuhn reached out about it, and I thought, "Wow, it's scary." Yeah, people were hurt in that in that accident. Uh, so there's been a couple of new concepts floated about, and now it, it looks like some investments are being made. RWE recently signed a letter of intent with a company called Windspider, and Windspider is a Norwegian-based company uh, and who is looking at a, a new modular self-erecting crane system. And the pictures online are interesting. It has a uh, kind of like an erector set around the tower, and then there's a crane at the top, so it's able to lift 
uh, blades and the cells from a ship and then install it on the top of the tower. So it, it builds the tower somehow, which is not described at the moment, at least online, I haven't seen it. And so it's a, just a different concept. It's not a ship-based crane. It's a turbine-based crane, which I think it, in some cases makes a lot of sense. So they're saying that it can have a, a lifting capacity of more than 1,200 metric tons, and it eliminates one of the pieces of motion, especially for fixed bottom offshore wind turbines. As a ship bobs up and down uh, and you're trying to move a, a ship-based crane, a, a blade, for example, and trying to mount it, it becomes sort of a little tricky. And they have obviously different ways of attacking that same problem. But you're seeing more and more new concepts like this wind spider idea of, of basically connecting something to the tower and using a, a, a more steady crane system. And I, I think it was at Intercon or one of the wind companies, I think it was Intercon, had tried something like this a year or so ago. If you look on YouTube, they have a really interesting video of a, a tower-based uh, crane that was, system. That was the logger, the logger way unit, right? Is that was, what it was the, called? Yeah, log, logger way, logger way, where they were, the tower was, the, the crane was actually climbing the tower yes. as it was building it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's a really smart technology. So RWE is now investing in this space. They can't be the only operator thinking about this because it's not only new construction, it's repairs or, yeah. or repowering. You, you're going to need some sort of platform to repower. Yeah. Joel, does this start to make a little more sense? When you're talking like repowers and stuff like that, I know that the Liftworks guys have been making some waves um, yes. on the, the, the nacelle top crane that they have. I think there's another right. company out there doing the same kind of something along the same lines. But, you know, being in that uh, the consulting world as Rosemary's as well, we see things come across like, oh, we have to mobilize a crane to the middle of nowhere just to do this one project. Well, the project just went from being uh, $200,000 to being a million dollars because you have to bring the crane up there, 35 grand a day for that crane and, and yada, 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 right? So that's just the right. onshore portion of it. The costs are extreme. So if you can get something like that, I think that Liftworks crane, you mobilize with like one or two trucks, boom, boom, up, down, right? Where a crane, like right. if you bring a, a, if you, and I'm gonna say that wrong, I always do, but the, the labor, like the labor 1300, I think those things take like 10 trucks to bring the whole thing there. Assemble it, it takes a couple of days. Use it for whatever, uh, you know, on standby cost, it's tens of thousands a day. And then once you're done, it takes a couple of days to disassemble it and then back on the trucks and out to the next spot. So hmm. any kind of, so, so what I'm thinking is this is the offshore equivalent of that, right? But in offshore, you have to have a specialized vessel where that vessel, that big right. crane vessel can be millions a day. Now you're able to go and take this out on a, basically a, a work boat and mobilize it to the, to the platform and build it up. Um, and you alleviate, okay, so now we're struggling with Jones Act stuff in the US. We have to build all yes. these specialized vessels. Well, now you don't have to have as specialized, you still have to have a specialized vessel, but not as specialized of a vessel, something that might exist in the marketplace. And you can throw this crane on there and, and jump it up and, and use it. So it, it, to me, it sounds like it's lowering the cost of construction and possibly some major correctives down the road. Well, yeah. And RWE is involved in a couple of offshore projects in the United States and, mm -hmm. and a ton of onshore things. So mm -hmm. investing in this as an operator makes complete sense to me. What I'm wondering is what happens on the design side for the wind turbines? Do you design the towers and the nacelles and the blades slightly Transition different piece. to accommodate, right, to accommodate yeah. a crane system like this? Yeah, I don't know. I think it would have to be most of the des redesign because I'm just looking at the images here of kind of how that's like a, a lattice work over the top of the tower. It looks like sure. most of the designing that would be different would be in the transition piece or the actual foundation of a floater rather than the tower or the nacelle or the blades itself. But maybe Rosemary, you can, you might have some more insight into that than, than we do. Right. What do you do with the 150 meter blade? <laughs> how do you handle that? If it's a, if the crane is based on the turbine itself, how do you, the geometry It's a geometry problem at that point. How do you do that? I think I would say you'd, you'd you'd pull it just like you would a normal one, but um, instead of having a two a two piece tail and midsection picker, you have a like the 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 bracket that goes over the middle of the blade and comes up. But I don't know. There's some, well, there's, some, do there's some there's some there's some kind of um, 
uh, cantilever type structure that's going to have to be built that have to be maybe counterweighted to get the blade up if you're tower based. I'm not sure. Right. And do you use the, the two piece blade? If you look at that Enercon video of their the trial of their um, tower climbing crane, so you can search Enercon climbing crane slash Enercon clettercran um, on YouTube and find it. They do show them installing um, blades. Uh, they show them first installing the tower segments one after the other, and it you know climbs up the one that it did um, before to put the next piece in on top. Um, and then afterwards, um, they show the blades coming up and they've got like this um, brace that they put from close to the, the root of the blade to about halfway along. And, um, and so, yeah, they're kind of picking it up in two points and then um, raising it up. Mm. And then there's an a, a, an arm of some sort, I don't know, some kind of, I don't know if it's a robot arm, but some, some sort of arm that comes out and, and grabs it and jigs it into place it's it's really cool it's very hard to describe in words for people just listening but get onto youtube and search it because it's uh it's, it's pretty cool the way that they're able to do that and then they've got a team of workers like actual human workers inside the the hub um you know like normal to kind of yeah. well they don't catch the blade the the big arm catches the blade but they're there to you know um to Guided. align it properly and get all the bolts in yeah I think, I think the term for that, like, and I don't know if it's the exact same thing, but this is from my my lifting background offshore. The term for that, like, piece in the lifting world, would be called a strong back. So it's like the, oh, where the where yes. crane would come down, and then it would be like the yeah. psh, psh, the piece that actually. So, I don't I don't know if it's the exact same thing, but no, I think you're right about that. Well, we haven't seen it this used in the United States yet, and if it is being used, the technology is being used. Maybe it's being used in Europe. But if you if you ask in the states right now, we're we're using standard crane technology to yeah. put wind turbines together right now. Mm -hmm. It would be a, a total game changer, I think, in terms of just technology. And, and Joel, I think back to your point, if we're going to be adding one hundred and twenty thousand wind turbines over the next couple of years mm -hmm. to get to around two hundred thousand wind turbines. You, there's just not enough cranes on the no. planet to service all those. You're going to have to come up with a different idea. Yep. That's something that's a little bit simpler to, to put up and down. And, yeah. yeah. You're right. Yeah. yeah. If anybody, if anybody, any, well, anybody listening in the field is, is using a different kind of crane technology, reach out, let us know how it works. Send some pictures, some video. That'd be really cool. Yeah, I was going to say you guys need that since it's apparently in the U.S. you're so keen on repowering everything every 10 years. <laughs> yeah, um, and, there we go. Yeah, running, <laughs> running your assets assets hard to get the most of those tax credits and then, you know, you, you need to. You need some more cranes than elsewhere in the world where maybe things are run a little bit more smoothly and gently by the sounds of things. <laughs> But I, I do know that cranes are a, a, a pain point in Australia as well. Um, you know, the, the cranes are kind of all um, all accounted for for development and then the projects I'm working on, it's always, you know, something unexpected has, has happened and if it happens after the wind farm's finished construction, then getting a crane on site is, is usually the hardest part, um, you know, in terms of trying to get things completed quickly. It's not always easy to get, get a crane out um, to these remote wind farms quickly. Well, one of the areas we haven't talked about a lot in the recent past is the small to mid-sized wind turbines. And what that group generally means is, are, is wind turbines that are less than one megawatt. And, and there's a, a cottage industry in the United States that's been around for a number of years, but you just don't hear about it very much. Well, that's going to change because NREL is in putting about uh, $3 million into 11 manufacturers of small and medium scale wind turbines. Uh, and they're looking to uh, make those awards, it looks like the beginning of next year. So they provided a list of these wind turbine companies, and some of them I've heard of before, and some of them are, are new to me. And I thought I'd just read them off so that everybody knew where to go search for if they're looking for a, a smaller or medium-sized wind turbine. You know, Berge Wind Power, which is a company uh, that I've heard of many times before. Uh, Center, uh, sorry, Carter Wind Turbines, EOCycle, America Corporation, NPS Solutions, and they're in Connecticut. Pecos Wind Power, which is in Massachusetts. 
Doesn't make uh, sense. Uh, <laughs> no, Pecos does, is not a Massachusetts word for sure. No, that's Pecos, Primus Wind Texas, Power. Man. <laughs> right, exactly. Right, I think the same thing. Primus Wind Power in Colorado, RRD Engineering, which is also in Colorado. Uh, Sunsite Wind in, in Georgia, Windurance. What a great name, Windurance, which is based in Pennsylvania. And Windward Engineering down in Utah, and then XFlow Energy Company, which is based in Seattle, Washington. And Rosemary, I, you, you get probably the same number of questions as we do at WeatherGuard of, hey, where can I find a small wind turbine? I have a farm, I have a, a, a state, I want to have some wind energy, where do I look? It's sometimes pretty hard to find some of these companies. Yeah, um, the question I get asked more commonly is, you know, I live in the suburbs and I want to put one on my roof and they answer to that and they want to know where they can buy a good one. And my answer to that is you will not find one because that's a stupid place to put a wind turbine. But this <laughs> second, um, you know, slightly larger <laughs> Um, kind of turbine for, yeah, people that have a, a bit of land and have actually a decent wind resource to, you know, put the turbine in. That's something that comes up a lot. And it's a real, like, I find it a real kind of like a cowboy industry. There's so many small wind turbines available, and especially a, a lot of really cheap ones that you can get off Alibaba or something. Um, and the internet is just full of people complaining about how they didn't do what they were supposed to do. And often, you know, the manufacturer claims uh, like it's not physically possible that they could generate that amount of power. Um, so I always direct people to use certified wind turbines. Uh, there is a certification system in in the US um, and I think that there's one in Europe too, but it's not as widely spread. And out of that list of manufacturers that you just read out, um, Bergie was the only one I've, I've heard of. I know that they've actually got a long track record with their turbines and their at least for some of their products are certified and that means that they have to actually um, you know test it and measure the output um, under you know the right conditions so you know that it, it it generates what they say it will and also that it lasts um, you know a decent amount of time and I just think that that's a absolute minimum if you're going to be spending thousands of dollars on a, a turbine then you you know you want to know that it's sure. going to actually generate some electricity for you because otherwise you just hear about people that are like you know either it didn't generate any electricity or two the second problem is that that you know oh, it just shook itself apart in the first you know strong wind event that we had and and destroyed itself so I hope that that's what mm. this um this program is going to you know be a step towards having more properly certified wind turbine, small wind turbine, so that people, consumers can have some kind of trust in, in what they're, they're going to get when they order it. Yeah, I think there's two, two phases there. One is a lot of these companies are looking to, to get that certification. And, and then there's a new interconnect rule. So when the wind turbine connects to the grid, there's certain parameters that it has to meet in terms of power performance, it sounds like. So th those are big hurdles for small companies. Mm -hmm. When you, we go after those kind of certifications, those are expensive. It's really hard to, to pass muster on. And especially if, if you have to go back and do a little bit of redesign to go through the process a second time, it, it adds up to, I'm sure, quite a bit of money. So NRL is looking to simplify that process, which makes total sense to me. And Rosemary, what are some of the proper applications for these wind turbines? Where would you see them installed at? Farms is the main one. And in, in Denmark, um, on the west coast of, of Jutland, it's super windy and you know it's not very densely populated. It's just a lot of kind of small, medium-sized farms. Um, and I, yeah, I talked to a few farmers. I was driving around filming wind turbines for um, one of the first YouTube videos, actually literally the first YouTube video that I made. Um, and I talked to some some farmers when I was asking them if I could film their <laughs> film their turbine, um, and you know they would tell me all about how it had worked, and you know they they loved it. That was um, you can get a you know a reasonable sized turbine can generate enough power to um, yeah to power a home with you know like four or five people living in it. Uh, they're still connected to the grid, so they don't have to worry about days when it's not windy, but. I will say, having lived in Jutland, there's not that many days when it's not windy, so they probably don't need to worry that often. Um, so that, that's that's a yeah, like definite easy case if you've got a fair bit of land and it's it's windy. Uh, but if you look at a wind 
map, a wind resource map, a global, you can look up Global Wind Atlas and they'll show you the wind speed all across the globe. Um, this area on the west coast of Jutland, it is definitely uh, in the, you know, the highest quality of wind resources where people actually live. Um, so it's not like any random farm anywhere in the world is going to have the same resource. But somewhere like that where you've got a good wind resource and enough space, um, definitely makes sense. And then the second place where it makes sense is where you're off grid. So you might not have a really great wind resource. You might have much better um, payback from your solar panels, but you, if you add a wind turbine, if it's not that good, you're at least getting some power overnight most of the time. And if you do have long cloudy periods, then you know, you're likely to get some, um, yeah, some power from your wind when you're not getting the solar. So then you're really paying for the reliability rather than the actual energy itself. Um, and other than those two applications, there basically aren't <laughs> aren't more more good places to put small wind turbines. Um, yeah, it's just you. Know, people are always showing me these new new wind turbine designs for you know like urban wind turbines or any kind of small wind turbine that just you know sits down close to the ground and the fact is that if the wind is not strong there is not much energy in the wind and you won't get much energy out of any kind of turbine no matter how clever the design is or what technological breakthrough they think they've got you know there's a lot of them that say oh this works in low wind speeds and you know it's like it things work but um is it worth it if it produces five watts um you know probably not um yeah so <laughs> i have pretty pretty strong feelings about small wind <laughs> after you know the doing the youtube for a couple of years now i get asked about it over and over again and um you just can't can't get a lot of energy out of slow wind and that means urban wind is never going to be a thing sorry Maybe in Chicago, the windy city. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> not a lot. Yeah, unless you're maybe downtown, Wellington. there's not a lot Wellington, of Wellington, New Zealand, is the windiest capital city in the world. Is it? I know that one of the, one of the things about uh, small some of these small wind things. I know, like Bergie it has is. it on their website as well. Is that um, they will qualify for ITC, and you can get tax big tax rebates on it, like thirty. Really? Yeah, thirty percent. It says they have they've got on their website some, some guidelines on it, and some also you might be able to apply for some state uh, uh, tax incentives as well, depending on of course where you live. Wow. Um, I'm in Texas right now, so I'm thinking about some of my friends that have some ranches and stuff out towards the western part of the state. Sure, um, that that makes complete sense. Yeah. Well, we'll put the list in the show notes, so if you're curious about. Uh, wind turbines, small wind turbines or medium-sized wind turbines. We'll have the list. Come to the show notes and you can find the links and, and check them out. It's it's interesting technology and I'm glad NREL is, is spending a little bit of money with these companies. That's, that's a good idea. I haven't actually taken a look at that list yet, but I will. It will be interesting to see how many of the turbines are your standard garden variety, three-bladed horizontal axis turbine, and how many of them will feature these, you know, new technologies that keep on popping up in the media multiple times every year. You know, will there be vertical axis wind turbines in there? Any ducts yes. uh, or any, yeah, no. anything like that? Um, yeah, because it's, it's been Explode. in the past, it's been proven impossible for anyone to actually make, you know, a cost effective small wind turbine like that. So second one on the list is a two blade. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, the, okay. in Denmark, uh, there was the popular turbine in Denmark was a two bladed one, a Gaia one there. They've gone out of business now, I'm pretty sure. But um, yeah, for small two blades makes quite a lot of sense. Ping Monitor is a continuous blade monitoring system which allows wind farm operators to stay ahead of maintenance. Wind techs can often hear damaged blades from the ground, but they can't continuously monitor all the turbines. They also can't calculate how bad the damage is or how fast it's propagating based on sound, but Ping can. Ping's acoustic system is being used on over 600 turbines worldwide. It allows operators to discover damage before it gets expensive and prioritize maintenance needs across their fleet. And it pays for itself the first time it identifies serious damage or saves you from doing an unnecessary visual inspection. Stop flying blind out there. Get Ping's ears on your turbines. Learn more at pingmonitor.co. So there's a big problem in Europe, which is that wind turbines are getting older. And they're getting older at a, an alarming rate. Um, a lot of onshore wind farms in Europe have reached their operational lifetime. 
And there's about 14 gigawatts in Europe at the moment that are they've been running more than 20 years. That's a long time. And by 2030, there'll be 78 gigawatts that'll need to get retired. Uh, that's a big problem. You, you think we have problems in the States. That's a big problem for Europe. Denmark, Spain, and Portugal have the oldest wind fleets in relative terms. Uh, wind power Europe has done an analysis there and looked at all these things. With the average wind turbine in those three countries of having an age of 12 years old. Wow. That, that's pretty old, right? Yeah. So that's, that's there. prime repowering territory, at least in the States it would be. Uh, and Germany has the largest installed capacity, which could potentially be repowered with 17 gigawatts that are older than 15 years. That's, again, a wow. little shocking, right? Yeah. So, uh, so there's there's about 170 wind farms in total that have uh, so far been repowered, uh, most of them in Germany. And the Netherlands uh, is sort of second in that. But So there's, there's a sort of a national repowering effort that needs to happen in, in the European countries. And based upon what we see here in the United States, uh, that effort needed – government funding to make make it happen and I'm, I'm wondering if if that's the same sort of effort that's going to be needed in the european union that without some incentives to repower the operators are just going to continue uh, leaving their assets out there and let them run until they eventually stop running and because there's no incentive to repower yet rosemary does that process make sense i think it's really interesting the difference in um the yeah, the, the two, this is first and maybe this is the last topic for the, the this week's episode. You know, at the start we hear about how, you know, turbines have a, you know, useful operating life of 10 years and then they've got to be repowered, which is kind of the US way of running it. And then here we're hearing the exact opposite of that in Europe where they're kind of, you know, just um, running them into the ground, just uh, just leaving them as, as long as possible. Um, because and I think that the difference is all of the in incentives and regulatory structure. And you can see how, um, you know, it's not something that's inherent in the winter. It's the same wind turbine that are being installed i mean in fact the european ones because they're so old they're obviously you know much um uh, less advanced technology than um most of the ones in the u.s because i think you were a little bit oh well you had a lot of early wind in in california i guess but um i think in general Texas. most of the u.s is a bit in, yeah yeah a bit later Newer. to the party um the wind energy party um and so yeah it's um it it's a good time now to be starting to repower more of the European ones because, I mean, you think about it, when wind energy first started taking off, which kind of sites were they developing? They were developing the very, very best wind resources. Um, and so now a lot of these, yeah, 15, 20-year-old wind turbines, they're in really great wind resources. They could be making a lot more energy if you, um, you know, you put new turbines up. But, I mean, what counts as repowering, though? Does that mean that you leave the foundation in place, the tower in place? Uh, you know, like how much of it gets left in place to count as repowering? Because obviously, like a wind turbine 20 years ago, I mean, how big were they? A, a megawatt? Um, they're going to be yeah, on, maybe. you know, mm -hmm. you can't just you can't yeah, just take them. a one megawatt wind turbine and go put a five megawatt, um, like a one megawatt tower in the cell and put a five megawatt rotor on it, that um, that doesn't work. So how far can you get with repowering? Maybe when they're that old um, and technology has moved so far, maybe you're better off, um, you know, getting rid of it and starting again. So I guess that will be that will be something, a decision for every every site to make about what's the best way to yeah. take advantage of this wind resource in the future. Yeah, there may be some decommissioning and then um, just using the grid interconnects uh, as long as they stay at the same, of course, you know, power faces and whatnot, uh, instead of the, you know, changing out a 1.5 for a GE15 for a GE16 generator, uh, that may not work. Uh, so a, qu a question or a thought here as well. So from Win at Wind Power Lab, we see quite a lot of uh, acquisitions, mergers, uh, people buying and selling these assets now in Europe, and we're helping a lot of them with blade maintenance strategies. So, some a lot of companies are taking on assets that have been in, uh, you know, in play for a long time in operation, and they're like, "Hey, man, this is 
this is the condition they're in. What should we do? How do we make, make sure that we get the most out of them? And one of the reasons we're, we're you know, the background analysis of is the prices, the energy prices in Europe right now, nobody wants to take a wind turbine out of commission for X amount of time to repower it because they're taking so mm -hmm. much advantage. Like we have, we've got trials right. of stuff we're trying to do with, with companies that are like, Hey, yes, yes. We absolutely want to do this trial with you guys and take a look at this or, uh, you know, X, Y, Z, but we can't do it until we have uh, like, there's, there's going to be a doldrum week or something because energy prices are so high right now. We're not even going to take something out of, uh, you know, out of production to, to look at a trial of, uh, you know, a new product or an inspection technology or whatever. Um, so nobody really wants to shut a wind farm, wind farm down to repower it either, just because the, the prices are so high. And I know that's a, that's a temporary thing for a long-term problem, but it's a, it's a reality as well. You, you can't let those assets set another three or four years. I think you're going to have a problem. Right? There's eventually yeah, going to break down. Yeah, they'll start. There's, things will start to fail bad. You'll have some, some. You'll get some runaways and some fires and some broken blades, and you're you're going to run there into some safety issues once you get too, too far down the line. Right, and in, in in a country like Germany, where they're now really dependent upon every bit of energy they can produce in country, you're right, Joel. Taking those assets down for six months to repower doesn't sound like a smart idea. They're going to have to stage it in some logical manner where they can keep the power production up. The energy crisis in Europe isn't changing in the next six months, I don't think. And and if, you, if you're thinking about repowering, Rosemary, I think you're right. You probably don't have the opportunity to, to put a two megawatt turbine on a 700 kilowatt no. tower. It's just not going to happen. So no. there's, there's, there's a lot of constraints there, which I go back to my original point is, I think you're going to need investment, tax credits, something to kickstart that repowering and probably a little bit of governmental oversight to make sure that you don't take down the grid too much in that transition. It's going to be a busy time over in Europe for repowering, for sure. So NASA has been working on putting people on Mars. If you've been following NASA for any length of time, this, is, this has been going on since uh, the U.S. landed on the moon. The next step was always Mars. And if you're going to put people on the planet of Mars, you're going to have to provide power well, there's only a couple ways to do that. You could have a nuclear reactor, which is probably the way it's going to start out, honestly. But solar power, that, that's the, sort of the next step. And as we've seen just recently in the news, uh, there's issues of sand and dust covering up solar panels <laughs> on Mars because you just lost a probe that's been there for about four years because it got covered with dust. Um, so one of the opportunities is wind. And NASA has been looking at putting wind turbines on the planet of Mars. Now, that comes with a little bit of difficulty because the atmosphere of Mars is about 1% of the atmosphere in, on Earth. So if you think about you stand outside, there's a 10-mile-an-hour wind. I don't know what that is in kilometers an hour. Six, I get uh, probably 15 or so. Uh, you, you can actually feel the wind push on you, right? So you think about, well, it's just 1% of that. Well, that's not a lot of energy in the wind to... To, to make a rotating power off a wind turbine. So there's, 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 a, there's a lot of complexities to it. So I'm curious as to where this is going. But if NASA is working on this, Rosemary, does it have some benefit for like wo low uh, wind areas on Earth that we can use some of the same ideas and technologies? Sure. I don't think um, for low wind speed areas, it's not like we need some sort of material science breakthrough or something like that. What you need is low a bigger rotor at lower cost so i think it's unlikely that the solution that they find for mars is going to be low enough cost that you can you know really generate a useful amount of cheap enough electricity on earth so probably not um, but it's definitely cool to think through what kind of wind turbine would you want on Mars. And it is a question that I get asked every now and then on my YouTube channel, actually. So I think I will have to make a video on this. But And I haven't haven't run through the calculations, but like you said, so the um, air density is about 1% on Mars. So that means, yeah, you reduce by 100 times the amount of power that you get for a certain rotor size. But I think at least in some places there are higher wind speeds um, and then because power in wind varies with the cube of the wind speed, you might make some of that back that way. 
but um, it depends if it's a constant high wind speed or if it's just, you know, occasional storms. Um, and then that's quite hard to deal with the same as on Earth. You know, like you don't tend to see uh, a lot of wind turbines in areas that have a lot of, um, you know, hurricanes um, because it's there's a lot of power in that that wind, but it's not there all the time. So, you know, you it's hard to design a wind turbine that will withstand that, but also be cheap enough to make um, cheap electricity the rest of the time. But I think that the killer would really be neither of those two things, but probably the um, all the, the the dust, right? It's a, isn't it quite a, a harsh environment in terms of the amount of dust and wind that's around um, and probably temperature as well. I think you're going to suffer from a lot of problems with leading edge erosion. I don't think you're just going to be making fiberglass wind turbine blades and putting them in uh, on Mars, uh, especially since for a little while there won't be a, you know, a lot of workforce to to be maintaining uh, these turbines. So I think that that's going to be the the difficulty, trying to, you know, make something withstand the Martian environment and have low enough maintenance uh, requirements because I guess it, spare parts will be hard to come by even even if people are living there. <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, Matt Damon in that whatever that <laughs> Mars movie was. The Martian. Seemed to be able to grow, the Martian, there you go. Uh, was seen to be able to grow potatoes in very difficult conditions and survive for another six months or whatever we just it need was. To, <laughs> right. We just need to clone Leonardo DiCaprio and um, make a whole wind, wind farm servicing crew out of the Leo clones, and then, then maybe we can make it work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it is a difficult problem, right? I think we – when – Years ago, when I was in, around uh, Mars vehicles that were being built in the space industry, it's just a very difficult place. Everything about Mars is hard. Mm -hmm. the, water, wind, dust. Yeah, it, it, solar is not great there. So there, there's just a lot of uh, difficulties. I, I don't – if NASA's attacking this problem, they'd have to – Go after the the erosion problem, right? I mean, that'd be the first problem you have to go after, and, and the high wind speeds, right? But but imagine if you get to be the company that says our LEP product was used on Mars, how how good <laughs> that would be for your your brand recognition and marketing and efforts in the in, uh, you know in on Earth. You could be those guys. That'd be you, a, you get it. You they'll be nail. using Killer. some crazy material that costs you know yeah. a million dollars a gram or something yeah. an amount of um the, the cost and the maintenance requirements are the are the killers it's just so different that um what people will pay for aero compared to what they'll pay for wind and also maintenance people don't understand that um no one wants to maintain their wind turbine you know they've got enough maintenance required already and anything new you add better be maintenance free or add like 10% extra annual energy production. Otherwise, um, people aren't interested. All true. Airplanes are pampered. Wind turbines are not. And it, that's just the difference. And it makes it makes it much more difficult. So the, so the Mars experiment, we think, is a thumbs up or a thumbs down? What do we think here? Thumbs down from Joel? No, it's a thumbs up for Rosemary? being cool. A thumbs down for <laughs> being applicable to wind turbines on Earth, I would say. It's cool, but I don't know if it'll actually work. <laughs> well, didn't they just put a helicopter on Mars? What, am I wrong about it's that? A was that a Mars no, it's, a, it's a drone, yeah, yeah, that comes off of the Mars, the new Mars rover. There you go. But with if we its, were able to do pump? that, that there's, there's, your, there's your example right there, Rosemary. If they figured out how so, to put a drone yeah. or helicopter on the surface of Mars, and, and it could live for any length of time, they must have something figured out, right? It can only, fly, But it can only fly for like – it's something super, super short. Like it can fly up like 20 meters and then it has to come right back. No. Like it's yeah. like it flies up, takes a peek. And then as far as I know, maybe the, the, there's, they've got some new missions for it or something. But it's because because of power density on board and the ability to fly in that atmosphere, it just can't do much. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, if anybody's the, flown if, – if, you, if you've flown drones in the United States and you've flown one in Houston, Texas, and you've flown one in Denver, Colorado, you'll – that's only 5,000 no. feet of difference in atmospheric difference, right? And it's crazy how yeah. much different it, it actually is. And then go from there to 10,000 feet or four. I flew I flew up at 14,000 feet one time in, in Colorado and you couldn't Ooh, fly yeah. for a, a drone for f five, six minutes that was, you know, and you had no control over it compared to at sea level. And that's just on earth. The atmospheric density makes a big difference. Yeah, as we all know, that's where all the energy comes from for wind energy. It's it's, it's mm -hmm. in the atmosphere being thick and heavy, and 
I'm moving at some velocity. There's a lot of energy in there. There you go. I'm moving fast. It's just math. Right? Right? That's all it is, Rosemary. It's just math. That's going to do it for this week's Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. Thanks for listening. Please take a moment and give us a five-star rating on your podcast platform. And be sure to subscribe in the show notes below to Uptime Tech News, our weekly newsletter, as well as Rosemary's YouTube channel, Engineering with Rosie. And we'll see you here next week on the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. Happy holidays. <laughs>